I am Brother Troy. Today my reader will be Brother Robert. And first I'd like just to thank, stop, as I always do, and um, thank God for this opportunity. Thank God for this opportunity to bring his word to his people and spirit and truth. I thank you, and may you be enlightened by the message today. With that said, uh, here at the Israel of God, of course, we teach the Bible according to subject and title. Today's title is Repent and Be Baptized. As I was putting this lesson together, I realized that this lesson is actually just a continuation of the last two messages that I gave. You know, the spirit of meekness and call the chosen and the faithful. Because once you understand those two, now you understand that your spiritual journey is complete once you accept Christ. And one hour way of expressing that is through the baptism. If you understand that Jesus himself, who had no sin, but was baptized, now you start to see the importance of it. And if we claim to be Christians, followers of Christ, we follow his lead, correct? So today, since the Lord has blessed us with ten souls that's going to be baptized today, ten, that's a record. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for us to fully understand both the significance and the meaning and purpose behind the baptism. So some of you, if, uh, if you had made the decision to become baptized, I hope that by time, or my goal is by time I, I go through this lesson, that you have a thorough understanding of some questions that you may have had, that I can answer those, and that you can truly come to see that God would have all men to repent and be baptized. That is his, truly his will. So with that said, you know what I always want to do? Uh, I want to go to the slide and just review today what I'll be covering. So if you brother, go to the next slide. All right. So in today's lesson, I'll be covering the significance of Jesus' death, why we must take part in the water baptism, repentance, a requirement for baptism, and walking in newness of life. So with that said, I have a few key terms that I would like to define that we're going to be using all day just to make this, uh, you know, add clarity to the message today. So if um, you guys would, get to the next one. Brother Robert is going to read these three definitions just so <clears throat> we can be clear on these terms because we'll be using them all of today. Go ahead with the first one, brother. Repentance, a deep radical change of both perspective and commitment, resulting in a moral and spiritual transformation, an inward turning, a disavowal of one's sins coupled with the embracing of a new way of life. Right. So basically... This repentance is nothing more than a desire to change, you know, a moral conviction. Intercessor. Go ahead, brother. Intercession. Intercession or intercessor. A prayer, petition, or entry on behalf of another. The act of, met of, of mediating between two parties for the purpose of effecting a reconciliation. One of the offices of Christ is that of intercession. In his capacity of mediator, he intercedes with God the Father on behalf of man. Right. And so, once again, this intercessor takes our prayers on his lips and presents them to the Father. But we have to be worthy of that. That doesn't just happen. Because Scripture tells you that, what, God doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner, right? You have to make a conscious effort to repent. Then he'll take your prayer up on his lips. Mm -hmm. All right? Last but not least, baptize or baptism. Go ahead, brother. Baptize or baptism. To dip or immerse. Mm -hmm. To dip or immerse or to plunge underwater. Mm -hmm. To wash. A sacred rite involving water symbolizing a purification from sin. Okay. So, 
to be baptized once again, uh, if you, if you, it all depends on where you go or what religion you're really taking a part in. Some people think that you can merely just do it by sprinkling. But what we're going to learn today that the word in itself means to be fully emerged. And by, like I said, by the time we go through these scriptures, you will have no doubt in your mind both what it, what it symbolizes and how to, how to perform it. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to first start by looking at the significance of Jesus' death. Because Jesus had a huge role to play when he came down. Because, of course, we know the beginning. We'll, we'll start off in Romans 5. You go to Romans 5. But we know the story. Adam and Eve sinned. Sin entered the world. There was nobody clean enough, right, that God could use to save all mankind. So he came himself. Lord himself. For 33 and a half years, took on the form of man for one purpose. Romans 5. Pick it up at verse 6, brother. Go ahead. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Mm -hmm. for, scarcely for, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Right. So imagine that. The scripture says, scarcely for a, right, a righteous man, what, one will die, right? And, and we see it all the time. You know, they show these military clips and, you know, uh, you got this soldier. He'll receive all these, all the, uh, the Medal of Honor, right? He saw harm coming to his troops or his platoon. And, get, you know, he took one for the team, right? But think about this. Say, God did it for the ungodly. Could you die for someone who, once again, doesn't do the Lord's will, may not even like you, goes contrary to basically everything that you've ever required of them? Could you die for that person? Because that's what God did. Once we really start to take a look at what it is he did, because what we're going to learn is, you know, he had to do this to save our life. He didn't have to do it. He chose to do it. In Psalms, it said him and the Father took sweet counsel to decide who was going to come down and save man. Mm -hmm. It could have just as easily been the Father, one that we refer to as the Father who came down. But continue to read, brother. Verse 8. But God command, commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Like I say, for a righteous man, hey, or for your family, being in the household, somebody comes in, the first thing, you know, a, a true man would do is, hey, make sure his family protected and go and see what harm is coming near his family's way. Mm -hmm. You do that for your family. Can you do that for someone that you don't like? Or does, I mean, that doesn't like you? That's what I'm trying to paint, the picture. God loved us. He loved us so much that where he overlooked everything. He put a covenant in place, and he's so true to that covenant, even when we broke it, he kept his end. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to learn. Continue to read, brother. Verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Right, and that's the justification. You've got to come up under the blood. That's what we're going to drive home today. That's the justification. But you see, when you read over in Romans, when Paul talking about the law can't justify you, no, it can't justify you. The blood of Jesus justifies you. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say the, the law is none and void. You have to keep the law. But it doesn't justify you. The blood of Jesus justifies you. Continue to read, brother. For if when we were hit, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Right. Do you see that word he used? Enemies. When were we enemies to God? Huh? That's a strong word, isn't it? Enemies. 
That's before he came and shared his blood. That we can be, because once again, the, the sin of the father can't dwell with sin. So there has to be a method put in place to clean us up to be presented to the father. And that's what we're going to learn. That's why Jesus came. So he can present us, once again, as a chaste version to the father. But it's a process. And one of those processes we're going to learn today is to repent and be baptized. Continue to read, brother. Middle of 10. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that's just a payment. He gave his life so we could leave. Continue to read, brother. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned over death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Right. So think about that. Right. It says death passed from Adam to Moses. But not necessarily. We didn't all commit the same sin that Adam committed, but we've all committed sin. Right. But what I want to show where we want to go next is we know that he came and he died for us. And people use that statement all the time, you know. Christ came and died for us. But what I want to show you, he didn't just die. He suffered. There's a huge difference. He suffered for us. You know, even just think about it, when you have loved ones, and you, and you say, well, how did she pass? And they say, well, man, you know, mama, you know, she passed in her sleep. Right? You still miss her. Still hurts. But to know she suffered? God suffered for us. He didn't just die. He suffered. Let's go to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Because if we really take a look at what he done for us, why wouldn't you come up under the blood? Why would you, have, why would you put this off? Say he was more and more than any man. Pick it up at verse 1. Isaiah 53. Pick it up at verse 1, brother. Go ahead. Oh, who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And I can say no one. The Jesus that, that we preach here, when, you, when you're talking to people about the Jesus of this Bible, they look at you like you're a Martian. Go ahead. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Right. So he didn't come to win a beauty contest. That was not his purpose. Go ahead. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Right. Say, see, he was despised. Imagine that. Because the, the world, they would have you think with Jesus that everybody would just run into his arms. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Same way you're persecuted for bringing this word. Remember, they put Jesus up to be killed for the words he spoke. So don't think when you go forward with this message that it's just going to be openly received. You see the resistance when you go out there with the true word. Mm -hmm. Continue to read, brother. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And afflicted. Like I say, he didn't just die. He suffered. Continue to read, brother. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Right. Hold your place right there. Put your marker in Isaiah 53rd chapter. Because we're going to go and take a look at that. Let's go to Matthew 27th chapter. It says, 
For he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. See, he started to cry, say his tears was like big puddles of blood. This wasn't a cakewalk, guys. Matthew. Robert, you're going to help me keep an S off Matthew today? <laughs> Matthew, the 27th chapter. Let's pick it up at verse 17. And here in Matthew, the 27th chapter, this is the trial of Jesus. And Pilate, at this point, he would have let, let Jesus go. Even his wife has come to him and saying, hey, listen, you know, I've been troubled in my dreams. This is an innocent man. But you know who put him up? Wasn't it Romans? We did. His very own. Right. The ones today, when you go out with this message, the very ones that are saying, I'm good. I ain't trying to hear that. Didn't want to hear it then, don't want to hear it now. Pick it up at verse 17, brother. Let's read into it. Go ahead. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who would ye have that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. And Barabbas, at this point, this is a convicted murderer. We're going to choose a convicted murderer over Christ who came to die for us. Mm -hmm. Continue to read, brother. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Mm -hmm. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? So I, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Right. She said, listen, she's trying to talk to her husband. You know, this just man has come to me in a dream. I'm troubled. I can't even sleep thinking about what y'all finna do to this just man. Continue to read. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Right. So who, who was leading the rally? Priests. Our leaders. Once we appointed, and even once we didn't appoint. Because, I mean, you look at it today. How many of y'all have nominated uh, Al Sharpton to be your leader? <laughs> Jason Jackson to be your leader. But whenever it, something go down, right, they speaking for the masses. Same thing here. Skip down to verse 24, brother. Let's go. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See ye to it. Right. That's the best thing he could have done. You know, I don't know what, what this is going to do for his status, but hey, he knew this man was just. He said, listen, I know I'm in charge, but hey, I'm washing my hands of this. If y'all want this done, he going to put it in their court. He in power, but he going to turn Jesus over to his people. Continue to read, brother. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And that's why we're suffering today. Continue to read, brother. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Right, so the beating started right then. See, they scourged him. They, they took him and whooped him right then. Continue to read, brother. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. <clears throat> and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Okay. If that's not enough, continue to read, brother. And they spit upon him, and he took the reed and smote him on the head. Right. Can you imagine that? Here it is, a world you created. You done left your, your godship to come down and save this man. And you got some men mocking you to the point, hitting you in the face, beating you with whips, spitting on you, putting a crown of thorns on you. But he did that for him, for me, for you. And all he asks is, hey, come up under repent 
come up under the blood, be one with me. This is for the sole purpose that I came. But once again, let's go back to Isaiah 53rd chapter. I told you hold your place. Because I, I, I just definitely wanted to drive that home because a lot of people use, use that uh, commentary all the time. Christ came and died for us. Next time you hear that, say, yeah, he did. That's a correct statement. But he suffered for us, too. You know, he didn't just come and, and, and you know, sit down and put some nerve gas on and went to sleep. No, that's too easy. Even you look at capital punishment today, right? Lethal injections. I guess, you know, at the end of the day, if that's what man decides. But you look at some of the, the harsh uh, treatments that some of the people went through that this person, you know, uh, I don't want to get too graphic, but like Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, they say one of the things that was fascinating with him, they say he would tie a person up. Because it was all about torture with him. He was fascinated with heart rates. He would tie a person up and just be cutting them real slow with his ear to their heart because he just wanted to hear their heart rate. Can you imagine that? Can, let's go back. Isaiah, I got sidetracked, brother. Isaiah 53rd chapter, let's go back to verse 6 and continue to read. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. <clears throat> he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is, no, is dumb. Right. So, so, he he op opened, so he opened not his mouth. So he opened not his mouth. He knew it had to be done. It had to be done in this form, because, you know, even, even the Lord tell, tells us. That even the Gentiles, that hey, he said, hey, I just told you to afflict him a little bit. You furthered the affliction. I didn't tell you to do all that to him. I mean, because when you look back in history, it was some, it was some bad things done. You know, granted the punishment is from the Lord, but he didn't tell him to do all that. And for that, a lot of people gonna pay. Continue to read, brother. Verse eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Mm -hmm. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Right. So it, he committed no sin, but it said it pleased the father to do this to him. Continue to read. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And that's what he did. He made his body an offering for sin. We were supposed to die. Because mm -hmm. the wages of sin is what? Death. Yes. We were supposed to die. But he came and did that. Go ahead, brother. He shall see his seed. And he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. And, he, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, mm -hmm. for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And that great is the father. Go ahead. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And that's us. He's going to give us access to the kingdom of God. If we'll do his will. Mm -hmm. Continue to read, brother. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Right, so there go that word. Intercession. Right? That's, that's one of the reasons he came. That's one of the reasons he came and died. So, because at this point, it's the Father who's trying to recover this, this creation. Jesus is taking our petition up on his mouth, presented to the Father. Sometimes you have to clean it up because, you know, as, as men, we all, sometimes we don't know what we should pray for. But let's take a look because you've always had to have an intercessor, right? Let's take a look at our first intercessor. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter. Because the scripture said, 
He would bear the sins of many and made intercession. And here in Deuteronomy in the ninth chapter, this is Moses, and once again, he's just rehearsing uh, some events back to the children of Israel. You know, because, hey, it always has to be that constant reminder with Israel. You know, we got that, that short-term memory. Matter of fact, uh, pick it up at verse uh, 5 and 6, and then we'll skip. Because he's going to let Israel know that, listen, don't think it's because of your righteousness that God's finna let us go into the land. It's, it's not that. Because we'll get puffed up real quick. We Israel, we Israel, you know, we the chosen. Watch with the Lord. Why would, you, why would Moses finna tell me here in uh, verse 5, 9 and 5. Go ahead, brother. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart doest thou go to possess their land. Mm -hmm. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doeth drive them out from before thee. Right, so the Lord just said, hey, it ain't because y'all right. It's just these folks are so wicked. They won't turn. I'm going to give you their land. But it ain't because of nothing you did. Continue to read. And that he may per perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good, good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. <laughs> <laughs> Moses, hey, Moses was letting them know. Can you imagine? Because once again, we're just looking at a few hundred people. Moses dealing with a whole nation. You out there with millions of people that at any given time, all you need is five to ten to start something. <laughs> Let's go to where we, was, uh, we originally started to go. Pick it up at verse 11, brother. Go ahead. And it came to pass at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. You see what the covenant is? Those two tables of stone, those Ten Commandments. Go ahead, brother. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence. For thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. You see how the Lord put that? <laughs> For thy people. The Lord ain't even claiming them. <laughs> Most of them, your people. Claiming them right now. Go ahead. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. Mm -hmm. They have made them a molten image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. So not only, so that's where Moses get it from, right? The Lord called us stiff-necked first. Mo Moses just repeating what the Lord called us. Mm -hmm. Continue to read. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. <clears throat> and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. Right. So at this point, the Lord is willing to start all over. Mm -hmm. He's like, Moses, I'll just take you, and I'll start all over. And sometimes, hey, I don't know. Maybe that should have been an alternative. If you look at this world, I mean, it is the corruption now and the things that we approve now. I mean, it's hard to, to even think where we're going to be in, in, in five years. I mean, because you turn on the television now, and it's like, you have to turn it right back off. You're like, man, ain't nothing godly about this. You just feel convicted watching commercials. Yeah. You know, you got two men sitting there, and I mean, it's a, it's a condom commercial. You're like, really? Yeah. Daytime? This is this, this 2 o'clock. <laughs> that's where the world at. It's acceptable. You the odd person. Where's your level of acceptance? That's what they're going to tell you. All right? Pick it up at verse 16, brother. Let's read. <clears throat> and I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, mm -hmm. and it made you a molten image. Ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I, and I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord <clears throat> as at the first Forty days and forty nights, I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned. Because of whose sins? Your sins. Moses pleading for Israel's sins, the intercessors. 
That's the role of this intercessor. And we had a great one. You're going to see, we had a great one. To be pleading for this people, <clears throat> who at the end of the day, they weren't in the wilderness but three days. Israel started complaining to the point to where, hey, they was like, let's pick a new leader. How are you going to replace a guy that we just seen split the Red Sea who brought us out of bondage? Where are the candidates? Who's going to replace Moses? <laughs> But that's what we did. <clears throat> Probably nobody came forward because they, they, they should call. They say, hey, let's, let's find us a new candidate. Continue to read, brother. Middle of 18. In doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Mm -hmm. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you mm -hmm. to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to, to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. And I took your sin, the calf which he had made, and burnt it with fire and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. Right. He was telling Aaron, hey, the Lord was going to get you, Aaron. <laughs> right? He says, but I took your sin. You see that? See, I took your sins. I took your name upon my lips and asked the Lord to pardon you, to give you a little bit more time to get it right. To the point, read verses, skip down to verse 24. Pay attention to this, guys. Go ahead. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights as I fell down at the first because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Right, so have you ever prayed for anything 40 days and 40 nights? Moses said he prayed before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights for this people. That's an intercessor. Think on that next time, right? When you really want a situation change, when you really trying to get the Lord's attention, he says some things only come by what? Prayer and fasting. 40 days and 40 nights for a wicked generation, an ungodly generation. But Moses was looking at the bigger picture. Maybe if we just continue to work with this people, be a little long-suffering, that eventually they'll get it together because this is God's people. He's holding on to that faith. This is still God's people. Can, can I turn the heart to these people? Continue to read, brother. Verse 26. <clears throat> I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Right. So let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, because now, now it's a little bit clear this statement that Paul's finna make in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Because we see what what Moses went through with this, with this people. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Pick it up at verse 1 when you get there, brother. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Right. So who was Israel baptized to? Moses. Why? Because he was the intercessor. They was baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea. Because you got to have an intercessor. Mm -hmm. Got to have an intercessor. But with that said, how do you get the intercessor to take your name up on his lips? He ain't going to just take your name up on his lips and plead your case to the Father just because. Continue to read, brother. Verse 3. And did all eat that same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All right. So we, we see that Moses was the intercessor back then. Let's go look at uh, the intercessor today. Let's go to 1 John, the second chapter.
See, this is vitally important. This is why he came and died. But he didn't die, just die, right? Suffer. This is why. First John chapter 2. <clears throat> Pick it up at verse 1, brother. Go ahead. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Right. And that's what he's doing. He's our advocate. He's our spokesperson to the Father. So when you sin or, or, or when you take time out to pray, Jesus taking that prayer, cleaning it up, presenting it to the Father. Because you can't, you can't pray directly to the Father. Even though you started your prayer off, our Father, right? You ended in Jesus' name. Because you want Jesus to take that prayer up on his lips to the Father. Continue to read, brother. Verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and, for ours, and not for ours only, mm -hmm. but also for the sins of the whole world. Mm -hmm. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So what's the sign that we know him? That's right. Which ones? All of them. That's right. And for those who don't know, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Right? Biblical definition of sin. Continue to read, brother. Verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Mm -hmm. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, and that's even key. as he walked. That's key. If, if you say you're a man or a woman of God, you got to walk as he walked. You can't be disobedient and call yourself a child of God. You something, but you ain't a child of God. Go ahead, brother. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. All right. So um, let's go to Proverbs, the 28th chapter. Because I said earlier that first we have to have a repenting spirit about ourselves. A desire to change. So we're going to look at this repentance because you just can't be baptized. First, there's the repentance. Proverbs, the 28th chapter. And verse 13, brother. When you get it, when I get it, we're going to read. Go ahead. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that's key. See, first you got to confess it, right? Then you repent, but then you got to believe. So it's confess, repent, and believe. That's what you got to do. You just can't, you know, um, say, hey, well, God, how many times have you heard this? God know that I'm in this flesh. The flesh is weak. You can't make excuses. See, because that's why he came down and, 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 and walked this himself. He know the temptation. The same temptations that we have today was the same temptations back then. You don't think they had alcohol? You don't think they had some kind of opium you could go and get high? You don't think there was, you know, fast men, fast women? The same temptations. So you're not going to be able to stand before him and plead your case. I'm going to want to hear it. Let's continue to move. Because the scripture tells us in Romans the 23rd chapter, I mean Romans 3 and 23, the scripture says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not just some, all. So let's go to 2 Peter 3 and 9. Like the scripture said earlier, you know, 
and we didn't all <coughs> sin out the similitude of Adam. You know, we, you know we, we know that we were born in sin, but you committed some sins of your own. You won't be able to just stand before God and say, hey, well, you know, other than the sin that I was born into, I stand before you clean. No. That's why he said he's going to look into your mind. He's not even going to ask you. He said he's going to look into your mind. 2 Peter 3, pick it up at verse 9. We're going to read that one scripture, brother. Go ahead. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, mm-hmm. as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's, and that's, and that's the will of God. He wants us all to change. His desire is that no one die. But you got to get rid of that old man. You got to get rid of them old ways, that old lifestyle, and that's what and that's what's so hard for a lot of people. Because can we sit here and say that all the food that was that the Lord deemed unclean doesn't taste well? No, that ain't why we don't eat pork. Why we don't eat catfish? Can somebody just ask you how does it taste like? I like it. I like the den. I probably would like it now. But that's not why you discipline yourself, right? You discipline yourself because the law says thou shall not. That's what's key. It's obedience. Because, see, obedience is going to show forth what you truly believe. Because if you don't believe that there are consequences to your actions, you're going to do whatever. You know, when somebody order uh, uh, a pizza that got something abominable on it, you're going to say, oh, you know, ain't nobody, you know, ain't nobody going to know but me, right? You and God, though. It's all about your, dis- I mean, about your obedience because you have people ask all the time, well, why this animal? Why is the duck unclean? I don't know. <laughs> you know, because the Lord says he's unclean. I'm pretty sure he created him. He know, he know why we shouldn't consume him. Right? Let's go to Matthew, the fourth chapter. I almost put an S on it, Robert. You're not paying attention. Because when this is Jesus starting his ministry here in Matthew, the fourth chapter. And I want... You really got, I want you guys to really pay attention to the message because this is the message we should have today. When you see people out evangelizing in the street and they condemning people, we're going to look at some examples. We're going to see, is, this, was, is that the model? Did Jesus just go around, right, condemning people? Or was his, his whole mission for them to turn? I want you to do the right thing. Matthew 4, pick it up at verse 17, brother. This is Jesus starting his ministry. Go ahead. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Right. So can you imagine this? You know, you're going through the town, and you see a group of people, and you say, hey, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You're like, what? (laughs) You know, but it wasn't until Jesus started doing the signs and the miracles and feeding, you know, the multitudes the way, wait a minute, something special about this guy, right? But the message the whole time was he's going through these villages, All this corruption, and he's telling them, hey, repent. Turn from what you're doing and follow me. I'm the way. I'll show you what it is that I would have you do because the direction that you're going in is not the Father's will. That was the whole mission. Continue to read, brother. 19. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And that's our job. 
Our job is not to go out here and find the, 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 somebody to battle with with the word of God. The message is reconciliation. You are in recovery mode. Then. When you open your mouth to talk the word of God, you are trying to pluck somebody out of the fire. You know somebody is lost, and, the, and you have the words to eternal life. And you're just trying to figure out a way effectively to deliver them so they can save themselves. Because you, you know that you're on the path of righteousness. You know that if I continue on in God's word, he promised me eternal life. That's what you're trying to share to somebody else. And listen, I'm not condemning, you know, uh, your lifestyle. Me. I'm saying, thus said the Lord. Thus says this Bible, you cannot enter the kingdom of God with that behavior. That's the message. It's not an attack on you. I got things I got to clear up. You know, you let them know that because the first thing they're going to say, what, what, do you not sin? Yes. And I'm working on it daily. Mm -hmm. I repent when I, when I, when I feel, um, when I do something I know that goes against God. All right. Let's go to Romans, the second chapter. Jesus calling for all men to repent. And for this reason, Romans, Romans 2. Pick it up at verse 1, brother. Romans 2 and verse 1. Go ahead. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. Right. So Paul said, you know, thou art inexcusable, old man. And we, and we without excuse. We know what the Lord's will is. We know that we should be walking in the commandments. Do we always, 100% always attain that? Are we pricking our heart when we don't? You should be. Because if you're to the point to where when you sin, it doesn't bother you, man, you need a lot of help. You need a lot of help and a lot of prayer. Continue to read, brother. Verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth mm -hmm. against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou should escape the judgment of God? Mm-hmm. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? And that's what it is. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. A lot of things you do in life, sure, nobody wants to go to the lake of fire. But you think that's why God wants you to serve him because you don't want to go to the lake of fire? No. He wants you to see. You know, the sure love and long suffering he has for you, the love of him. That's why he wants you to turn. It's just like a man and a, and a woman. You, you want your wife to be with you because she fear you or because she love you? Because if it's based on fear, then once again, hey, the moment that you feel that, hey, I can take this person or I can just leave, you out. He don't want, now granted, it's there because, once again, God is righteous. And the alternative to that is, hey, when you're wicked, I can't give you a righteous reward. It's got to be something on the other side or why be righteous? I just do what I want. But the punishment is not there for you to do the right thing. should be the goodness that leads you to repent. You should want to do the right thing. Right? Let's go to Mark, the second chapter. And it's not always easy. You know, I'm sitting up here and I'm saying these words. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to do the right thing. But the more and more we do this, the easier it should become. You know, same things that you struggled with last year, you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't be struggling with those this year. And then you set a new mark. And then you build upon it. And before you know it, things that used to tempt you, things that used to draw you away from the word of God, 
They don't, I mean, you don't even entertain those things anymore. That's how it's done. It's a process. I mean, you look at a person who's trying to stop smoking. Do they just say, some people, they say, you know, cold turkey. I just stop smoking. But for most people, they say, hey, man, listen, you know, I used to smoke a pack a day. I'm down to a half a pack. Now, I don't even buy cigarettes, but if I see somebody smoking, I want one. And before, no, before you know it, you run into that person and say, hey, man, I used to smoke a pack a day 10 years ago. You say, how did you stop? He's like, man, it wasn't easy, but this is what I did. It was a process. Same thing. Same thing with doing the will of God. You're just not going to wake up and master, you know, what it is that God would have you do. But if you make an honest effort, every day you wake up, pray, try to do the right thing. Before you know it, that'll be your lifestyle. Right? Yeah. Mark 2. Mark, the second chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse 15. Mark 2. In verse 15, because see, this is where a lot of us, you know, this is where a lot of us, uh, we struggle with. 15, Mark 2 and 15, pick it up, brother. And it came to pass as Je- and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Mm-hmm. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Right. So here we go. This is Jesus hanging out with publicans and sinners. But is he just hanging out to be hanging out? Because, see, this is where we get in trouble. (laughs) You know, is he just hanging out to be hanging out or is he hanging out with, you know, a mission? He's trying to get them to turn. He ain't just down there, hey, hanging under the tree. <laughs> no. No, that is not the case. Continue to read, brother. 17. When Jesus heard it, he says unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right. Think about that statement. See, that's where there's hope for me and you, because we're all sick. You know, you just got a different sickness or ailment than I am. But you come to the house of God to get healed. This is where the bomb is. This is where you come and, hey, if you were struggling with something, this is how you learn the way. Because you're not going to learn it over in the world. You're going to pick up more bad habits because that's all that's around you. This is where you come. This is where you learn repentance, and this is where you exercise it. 